Let's journey together from our homeland to the heartland of Israel. It's a life-changing experience, and only in the Holy Land will you be able to walk where Jesus walked, to see and feel the places where the disciples followed, where Jesus lived, taught, was crucified, and resurrected. The Bible will come to life before your very eyes as you experience the Holy Land. Let's take a look at some of the biblical places you'll encounter. Along the Mediterranean Sea, you'll see Caesarea National Park, Herod's ancient city. The city, palace, huge theater, a large hippodrome, and the 26-mile-long aqueduct were built by King Herod, 1st century BC. The Pilate Stone was also discovered here, the only archaeological item that mentions Pontius Pilate, by whose order Jesus was crucified. Philip, Peter, and Paul have a long history here. Here, the first Christian baptism was conferred on the Gentiles. Tel Megiddo overlooks the Jezreel Valley, also known as the Valley of Armageddon. It's one of the most ancient settlements in the Middle East, inhabited for approximately 6,500 years BC. Ruins have remained from battles and 26 layers of habitations can be seen. Whoever controlled Megiddo controlled the trade routes from Egypt and Mesopotamia. At its prime, Megiddo was ruled by King Solomon, 10th century BC. Today, it's a World Heritage Site. That means it's of universal significance. Atop the chariot city of Megiddo are iron exhibits that will help you see what the stones were constructed for. See the metal horse here? He's at a feed trough. It's also known as a manger. Below Megiddo, the ancients constructed an elaborate water system which allowed spring water to run from outside the walls under the city through a long tunnel and be drawn from underground pools for use. Even in times of siege and war, they would still have water in the city. In the New Testament, John predicts that the last battle between the forces of good and evil to end all destruction and persecution will take place at Megiddo, otherwise known as Armageddon. We'll be able to see where many of Jesus' miracles took place. Cana of Galilee is the site of Jesus' first miracle. In John 2, Mary told the servant, Do whatever he tells you, and the water was turned into the best of wine. Below this church is a huge vessel that would have been used during these weddings. What Jesus did here in Cana was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, causing his disciples to believe in him. Right on the edge of the modern city of Nazareth, we'll explore Nazareth Village, a Christian faith-based open-air museum that reconstructs and reenacts village life in the Galilee during the time of Jesus. Actors dress in period costume, showing us how farm, domestic, and craft work was performed 2,000 years ago. We'll see homes, terraced fields, wine and olive presses, shepherds and farmers herding their animals right outside this modern city. Weavers and crafters will display their work here in Nazareth Village. On the west side of the Galilee is Magdala, Mary Magdalene's hometown. Here we'll see so many things. An excavated synagogue where Jesus actually taught. The Magdala stone, which depicts the oldest menorah symbol and the only chariot of fire in Israeli archaeology. The entire fishing village of Magdala the beautiful boat chapel, and other chapels representing the miracles of Christ. In scripture, Jesus visits Magdala by boat. Mary was cured of seven demons, and she was a huge supporter of Jesus' ministry. The whole Magdala Center will be amazing. Come sail and worship on the Sea of Galilee with the only Galilee sailing company owned by a Jewish believer in Jesus. You know, Jesus spent a lot of his ministry around and on the sea. This is where he took the coin from the fish to pay the taxes, healed the paralytic, fed the 5,000, where he walked on the water, and where he rebuked the wind and calmed the sea. You'll see the Galilee boat that was used during the time Jesus walked and sailed on the sea. You'll sail on the sea, feel the gentle breeze, and worship with Captain Daniel Carmel, who prays and believes you will feel the Lord's presence and anointing during your worship experience on the Sea of Galilee worship boat.
also on the Sea of Galilee and beneath the foundations of this glass Byzantine church of Capernaum, archaeologists made one of the most exciting biblical discoveries. It was a simple 1st century A.D. home, probably the house of Peter and the home of Jesus in Capernaum. The house appeared quite ordinary until after the death of Jesus. Then the function dramatically changed. Walls were plastered over. Pots and bowls were now large storage jars and oil lamps. Radical alterations indicate the house was no longer a residence, but a place for communal gatherings, probably the first Christian gatherings or home church. The interior of Peter's church has this glass observation area in the very middle looking down onto the foundations of Peter's actual home. There is more than 100 graffiti scratched in the early church's walls, saying things like, Christ have mercy, Lord Jesus Christ help thy servant. Peter is mentioned numerous times in these markings, and etchings of a cross and a boat were also discovered behind the plaster. Peter's home church survived for more than 300 years, until it was replaced with an octo octagonal church right over the ruins. Today, it is still visible beneath the glass floor of the sanctuary that hovers over Peter's house and the probable first Christian church in the world. This is going to be so exciting to see. We'll visit many areas in northern Israel, the next being Capernaum. It's where Jesus lived during most of the years of his ministry. Matthew 4.13 says, Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. The synagogue ruins were from the time of Jesus. The walls were made of four-foot-thick worked stone. Here, Jesus healed the servant of the centurion. He was confronted by a demoniac while teaching, and he taught, probably in this synagogue, on the bread of life. In the center, you'll see the Church of Multiplication. It lies on the nor northwest shore of the Galilee in the town of Tabaga. Through the centuries, different shrines, monasteries, churches have been built here. The first being in 350 AD by a Jewish believer. Inside is the mosaic of the fish and loaves, and it was laid next to a large rock. Many New Testament scholars believe the builders of the first church believed that Jesus stood on this rock when he blessed the fish and loaves just before the miracle of multiplication. The Mount of Beatitudes is the setting for Jesus' most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. It lies on the northwest shore of the Galilee and is one of the most beautifully serene places in all of the Holy Land. It's also understood to be the place where Jesus met his apostles after his resurrection and commissioned them to make disciples of all nations. The Jordan River rises on the slopes of Mount Hermon between Syria and Lebanon and flows southward through northern Israel to the Sea of Galilee and empties into the Dead Sea. It's a vital Middle Eastern river that nourishes the land and its people for 156 miles. The River Jordan is the site where the Israelites crossed into the Promised Land and where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. We'll visit the river and have the opportunity to be baptized at the Yardinet Baptismal Site, which is beautiful and it's operated by a kibbutz. If you choose to be baptized in the Jordan, you'll bring your bathing suit this day and rent a towel and white robe for covering during the baptism. There's nothing that can compare to being baptized or renewed in the same river as Jesus. We'll also visit Mount Gilboa within Herod National Park. This is the spring of Herod, or Gideon's spring, where he chose 300 warriors to battle the Midianites. The famous water test dropped Gideon's large army down to 300 men, who drank with a cupped hand instead of those who lapped as a dog. This is a great example of how man's odds, 135,000 Midianites to 300 of Gideon's army seemed impossible for a victory, but faith in the one true God is a majority, no matter what the odds. Jerusalem is such an amazing city. Our first stop near the old city will be on the Mount of Olives. The colorful Church of All Nations enshrines a section of bedrock where Jesus is said to have prayed before his arrest. Immediately to the left of this church is the Garden of Gethsemane. We will spend some time here in this very special place. 
on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane are olive trees that are the oldest recorded in the world. As they grow, they become really gnarled and their trunks become hollowed out and only the newer growth remains. Many believe these are the trees that sheltered Jesus as he prayed and where he was later betrayed by Judas. As you stand on the Mount of Olives, you look over the Kidron Valley and straight to the Eastern Gate. In Acts 3.2, it's also called the Beautiful Gate and the Golden Gate. See it in the middle of the Eastern Wall? It was actually sealed in 1541 AD by the Ottoman Empire to prevent the Jewish Messiah from gaining entrance to Jerusalem. The exact, this exact gate did not exist at the time of Christ. The one Jesus entered through is below the present-day ground level. We'll explore some of ancient Jerusalem in areas such as the Davison Center Archaeological Park and the city of King David with Hezekiah's Tunnel. We'll walk on the streets and the levels where Jesus and his followers actually walked. Standing beside the pools of Siloam and Bethesda, where Jesus healed the blind man and the paralytic, will be an inspiring time for us. Both to appear to have been actual mikvahs or Jewish ritual baths. Beside the pool of Bethesda is the St. Anne's Church. Here we can praise and worship the Lord with the most beautiful acoustics imaginable. Western Wall is the most holy site in Israel to Jews and Christians. Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt nine times. Through it all, one symbol remains intact, the Western Wall. It remains dear as it is the spot closest to the Holy of Holies of the Second Temple. In the words of Isaiah, this is a house of prayer for all nations. Thousands from all religions come to the Western Wall to lift their prayers to our Heavenly Father. In 2018, approximately 4 million tourists visited Jerusalem. The Western Wall is a World Heritage Site, and prayers are lifted from here continuously. Here you can see the rolled-up prayer request that people place within the cracks of the wall. The wall is divided where the men pray on the left and the women on the right. Just in front of me were young Jewish soldiers praying. They count it a great honor to pray and guard the freedom so that all can pray at the Western Wall. Just to the right of the Western Wall is the walkway to the Temple Mount. It's a holy site to three groups, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The Gold Dome building is called Dome of the Rock and is an Islamic shrine built in 691 AD. Muslims believe their prophet Muhammad's night journey to heaven started here. For the Jews, the Holy Temple was here. Jacob's dream of angels and ladders, Abraham's obedience, and God drew the dust from which he would create Adam from the pinks here on Mount Moriah. For us Christians, this area is very significant because it is here that Jesus performed a cleansing of the temple, where as a child he attended all the Jewish festivals, and where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. It is a beautiful World Heritage Site. This is David Street in the Old City. We may walk down it to get to the Western Wall area or the Via Della Rosa. It is so beautiful with its ancient narrow streets, many vendors, and original pathways, rocks, and steps on which to walk and shop. We'll walk along the Via Della Rosa, which means Way of Suffering, that commemorates by stations where Jesus walked on his journey to be crucified. Approximately 2,000 feet of narrow walkways memorialize the numerous things that happened to him along his walk. It starts with the trial by Pilate and ends inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the gray domed church in the background. You'll be able to venture underground to the excavated Western Wall or Kotel Tunnels. They connect the Western Wall prayer area to the northwest side of the Temple Mount, passing along the side of the Temple Mount and under present-day homes in the Old City. 
the experience of walking along the tunnels is like taking a time machine back to the time of the second period. The huge Herodian stones are just unbelievable. These pillars are part of the Herodian road that are at the same level as the foundations of the original Western Wall. It's remarkable to see street columns way below the present day streets of Jerusalem. I had to touch the largest foundational stone. It's 44 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 11 and a half feet high. It's an engineering feat that marvels that of the great pyramids of Egypt. How could these huge stones have been quarried and moved? This one weighs about 570 tons. These questions and many more will be answered here underground at the Western Wall Tunnels. In the Jewish quarter of the Old City, you'll see the Temple Institute's Golden Menorah. This menorah weighs a half ton and is valued at three million U.S. dollars. We will marvel at its beauty and envision its ultimate standing place in the Kodesh Sanctuary of the rebuilt Holy Temple. At the Temple Institute, many other furnishings are built and awaiting the Third Temple. The Mahan Yehuda Market, often referred to as the Shuk, is the largest and most famous in the Middle East. Over 250 vendors sell everything you can imagine, like fresh fruits and vegetables, baked goods, spices, teas, fish, meat, cheeses, nuts and clothing, everything you can imagine. The color and bustle of the marketplace is really exciting as vendors call out their prices to passer buyers. It's one of my favorite places in Israel and where most of my shekels go. Vendors, shoppers, hikers, musicians, and even grand pianos can be seen along the shook. Whether you're here day or night, the views of the old city of Jerusalem are just amazing. You'll sense his presence, and you will fall in love with Jerusalem and God's people. Afterwards, you'll be praying Psalms 122.6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May there be peace within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. You'll be praying this Psalms from a much, much deeper place in your spirit as you will just be so touched. Just outside the walls of Old Jerusalem is the Israel Museum, where we'll experience the Shrine of the Book. This unusual shaped building protects the Dead Sea Scrolls and many other biblical texts. At Qumran, the entirety of the Book of Isaiah was found and is being preserved right here at the Shrine of the Book. These are the ancient scrolls as they appear after many years in the vessels. They were written mostly in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek on leather and papyrus scrolls. Dating between 150 BC and 70 AD, they're on display here in the shrine for our viewing and enrichment. Outside the old city, yet in Jerusalem, is the Yad Vashem. It's Israel's official memorial to the Holocaust victims dedicated to preserving the memory of those killed, honoring the Jews who fought against their Nazi oppressors, and honoring Gentiles who selflessly aided Jews in need and research with the aim of avoiding such an event in the future. This is the History Museum. The architecture is just astonishing and the displays are genuine and so stirring. You cannot miss the Yad Vashem. Outside the Yad Vashem is the Garden of the Righteous, where many memorials exist and trees are planted to honor those non-Jews who during the Holocaust risk their lives to save Jews. To the right is the tree planted to honor Schindler. There's also a very unique and moving underground memorial to the 1.5 million children lost to the Holocaust. The stone pillars on top without faces stand for the children whose lives were never finished. It's the most deeply touching memorial I have ever witnessed. After we've experienced Jerusalem, we'll head south to the Salt Sea of the Bible. Now we call it the Dead Sea. You'll descend to the lowest place on earth, about 1,300 feet below sea level, to the inland lake that is eight and a half times saltier than the oceans. The Salt Sea is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Some places it may be very clear. Other places may be darkened by a black mud bottom. 
at the Dead Sea, you can easily float on top of the water. It's actually really hard not to float. It's a major center for health research and was one of the world's first health resorts, for King Herod, that is. You might want to just wade, enjoy from a distance, or refresh your skin with a mud bath. If you give yourself a mud bath, you'll save about $100 in a spa fee and get the same results. Sometimes Pistacio the camel is here, and we can take an entertaining ride. The Dead Sea is really a wonderful experience. From the Judean Desert, just west of the Dead Sea, we'll be taking an aerial tram to the top of Masada. Here, Herod built palaces for himself in the first century before Christ. The ruins are magnificent, and it's the site of the last survivor's refuge of the Jewish revolt of 73 A.D., who chose death rather than Roman slavery. It's an amazing symbol of the continuing human struggle between oppression and liberty. It's also a World Heritage Site, second only in visitation to Jerusalem. Very close to the Dead Sea is Qumran National Park. In this mountainous desert region in 1946, a miraculous discovery was made by a teenage Bedouin boy. After throwing a rock into a cave and hearing something break, he found ancient scrolls inside of clay vessels, of which he took to the leaders in his camp. More scrolls were uncovered, which were later revealed to be the oldest biblical scriptures ever found. In total, the 700 scriptures are monumental in implication, as they contain evidence of speeches by Jesus, ancient Jewish prayers, and the Old Testament scrolls. The Qumran scrolls also affirmed the foundations of Judo-Christianity. Here in the dry caves of the limestone cliffs, just behind the Qumran Visitor Center, is where most of the precious scrolls were found. This cave, number four, yielded the highest number of ancient texts. Remember, you'll be able to see these ancient scrolls at the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. We'll be able to spend some time in the Judean desert. At Genesis land, we'll experience life in the desert as it was during the time of Abraham. We'll be greeted by costumed biblical characters, eat lunch in Abraham's tent, and participate in Old Testament time activities. After our time in the southern desert, we'll head back to Jerusalem. One of our last visits in Israel would be to the Garden Tomb. It was discovered in 1867. It's outside the city walls and is next to a rock formation that looks like a skull. It conforms to what we would imagine when reading the Gospels. It's really similar to the types of tombs that would have been used during Jesus' time. Here it is quiet and we're planning on taking communion at this Garden Tomb. It will be a very special place and time led by one of our pastors on the trip. All of Israel is so inspiring. The whole country is important to our Christian faith. The cities are among the oldest in the world. Real places that you will see will be etched in your mind forever. When you hear the teachings about Jesus' miracles, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt their validity, as you would have seen that preserved sight with your very own eyes. You will never be the same once you experience the Holy Land. God will seal your heart with His Spirit. We've presented to you many of the sights which Christians long to see in the Holy Land. Come, be overwhelmed with the sights, sounds, and presence of the Holy Spirit. We can guarantee you will never, ever be the same. It will be a cherished investment for your life. We would love to have you make this Holy Land pilgrimage with us in 2019. May your footsteps be guided by His Word and the precious Holy Spirit as you seek the Lord on experiencing the Holy Land with us.